winding wheel move today in Yorkshire and no heavy-handed picketing was required to ensure that the 50-odd pits in the biggest coal field in the country didn't work. People will know it started at Carton Wood, which is a small Yorkshire pit, not a big one, and it started there. They decided to close it. The coal board gave their reasons for closing it. The Yorkshire miners didn't agree, so they went on strike to save that pit. And then it spread within Yorkshire, and then it spread within other coal fields, Lancashire, Nottingham, Leicester, Durham, fairly quickly. Scenes at Lancashire's biggest pit at Parkside near Newton gave a clear indication of the split in the workforce there. On the buses, the men abiding by the area delegates' decision to return to work. On the picket lines, their own colleagues trying to persuade them to turn back. In all, about 200 men changed their minds. The majority of the workforce went on strike and everybody followed suit. Virtually everybody came out on strike at Parkside. They were just the odd one or two that, that didn't. We was talking about what we were going to do. And we did say, if it comes to strike, we will strike, because it's our job. When I was at Pold, I remember there was a list pinned up, and it said, these are the pits that are going to be shut. Not, these are the pits that are going to be part of the consultation committee agenda, which is what Parliament said there should be before any pit closure, but these are the pits that are going to be shut. Well, the first incident, I think, uh as regards to knowing about this strike after reading it in newspapers and listening to news uh, was when I went uh, one day at Goulburn and there were some bold miners there asking for our support and uh, I mean at Goulburn we, we didn't seem to know what was going on all that much and uh, so I said well I said well let me go to Union and see what uh, they say, and uh, we'll go from there. It just filtered through and filtered through, and we was in a pub, because you didn't have your mobile phones or anything then too, and uh, just said, right, from this day, we're on strike. We're at Union Cabin, and this gang come from Yorkshire. He said, my name's Ernie Bacon, and your men ain't going down that pit today. So we just tell him what day. We, we weren't giving, and from that it just carried on and carried on and we'd be, three of us would be walking, me, Jack Rathbone and Bill Smith would be walking up road after having been picketing all day. So I'm going back to work tomorrow. But that going back to work tomorrow lasted 12 months. When he came home and, and said there would be a strike, I, I was worried and upset, frightened, thinking what will we live on, how we pay our bills, and what would we eat? <laughs> um, but um, I could see that there was no other way. It was never about the money. It was always about the jobs. You know, Arthur Sky, the leader of the NUM, Margaret Thatcher being Prime Minister, there was there was a well-known clash before it clashed. And obviously, as the strike went on, that clash went on. Mr Scargill, you've issued a statement tonight asking your members not to cross picket lines. Does that mean any picket line, whoever mounts it, wherever? It means that the members of the National Union of Mine Workers are being asked, as they're being asked all the time, not to cross picket lines. And this is in accordance with the principles of my union and the principles of the trade union movement and uh, she brought McGregor in, which caused another clash. The miners clashed with McGregor, they, they clashed with Margaret Thatcher, they clashed with the government, but we'd had that previous experience with Ted Heath, you see. I don't think the Tory party uh, ever forgave the miners for the, the victory in 72 and 74. More or less common knowledge, I would say that. And I don't think they really covered it up. So really, knew, we knew they was out to get us. And uh, of course the Tories was headed by M Margaret Thatcher, probably one of the evilest prime ministers ever in British history. And she saw it as a chance, I think, I'm not too sure, if 
from memory now whether she was riding out Falklands War, she was. Uh, I think probably she spied a chance because uh, her popularity rose over at Falklands War to uh, bring in McGregor, uh, Ian McGregor I think his name was, who was an arrogant pig and uh, he, he was renowned for bullying unions. But you can see many more pit closures in the near future if the strike continued. I would say that uh, as far as we're concerned, we're carrying on the program which has already been outlined. And therefore, if indeed these people are threatened or intimidated, uh, then if the pit is sacrificed in the process, that is what's going to happen. And uh, I think people knew writing was out well in that, the, the, in respect of a fight. And uh, they made no moans about it ever. It was, no, it was known. So she used it to flatten the miners. There was clearly a big plan and everybody knew that there was a big plan. It, it would be silly to pretend that we didn't know there was a big plan. Of course we knew there was a big plan. That's what she'd been elected on the back of. It, it wasn't as though this wasn't in the manifesto or anything else like that. They'd taken on the steel and the printers, the steel workers. They'd tested out the legislation with Eddie Shaw in Warrington. Um, and they were still testing it out. And I remember one time I was working on the surface. I'd been injured. I can't remember what I'd done. But nothing serious, but I'd been injured. So I was working on the surface. You work on the surface, you get surface pay instead of sick pay. And um, German steel, or certainly foreign steel, was brought into Bull Colliery as opposed to British steel or authorised steel. And this was fairly new to me, um, but we didn't unload it, we left it. Who unloaded it? Probably the bosses, probably other shifts, I don't know, but we weren't unloading. In support of British Steel, we were supporting their, their cause, we were supporting their strike in not using foreign materials where we could. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't reciprocated by the steel workers. When the miners strike came, as far as I can recollect, On the early days, uh, you just had the uh, your normal pit lads there, and you had you had like in Goulburn, it was a village. You just had the village bobbies there, you know, and the odd one. And then when you tried your best to stop these people going in, people that you worked with, you know, and people that you went to football with or rugby or whatever, seeing them cross the line, it really give you a kick in the guts. Yes, there were some some frightening moments in the mind of strike and. Um you know, um, people who went back to work, a lot of them got um, vicious phone calls uh, from, may have been the, the, their own workmates. Striking miners had directed the suspension threat at the only Lancashire pit which has kept working normally. But after 700 men at the Agecroft Colliery met at lunchtime, the hostile reaction of the pickets indicated that the miners had not changed their minds. The meeting over, the miners drove off, saying nothing of the decision. But it's understood most voted to continue working while their lawyers test the legality of the suspension threats. Tell me what you think it seems that only a few, afraid of losing their membership, have decided to back the strike after all. Most will work normally. I think the majority will, but quite, there's quite a lot like myself who don't want to be suspended from the union. The turnout at Agecroft tomorrow will be watched closely by other divided NUM areas to see exactly what effect this latest bid for solidarity has had. The, the, the violence that came through the strike, no particular one incident, uh, but whatever violence came through the strike, was purely frustration. Um, I've never had it since, um, you know, the frustration that you, f you feel at times. Because um, there was no corner to, you, you just couldn't turn anywhere. You know, you, 
you was focused on what what your objective was, and you had to stay with that. We had no help, you know, on each other. Four months into the strike, June, July, I left home where I live to walk to the colliery to pick it, quarter to six in the morning. And I got to roughly about, you know where the golf driving range is on Ashton Road? I'd roughly got to about there. Police van pulled up, pulled alongside me. I was walking, the police van pulled alongside me. Where are you going? I'm going to work. You're not working, you're on strike. Well, I'm going to my place of work. You're not. I said, I am. It's lawful to pick it. You're not going to your place of work. If you don't turn around and go back where you've come from, you'll be arrested. And that was one summer's morning on Ashton Road. And I carried on walking another few yards and a policeman got out of the van. It, they, they were all in the back, there was three in the front. And he says, I'm telling you, walk another four yard in that direction and you're arrested. I says, on what charge? He says, we'll make something up. So I had to turn round and walk back, but I didn't walk back home. I turned left into Edge Green Lane, walked past Asda and picketed the back gate at the colliery where the Labour Club used to be. It was generally hurling abuse, screaming, shouting, shouting all kinds of names and the usual stuff. Uh, sometimes stones were thrown, windows were smashed. Uh, one occasion, uh, I believe an axe was actually smashed into the side of the coach. I don't know if it's true or not, but it, uh, that's what I got told. I, I didn't actually witness that. But uh, as we could see on the news, um, all over the country, you know, people going crazy, you know, the pickets, flying pickets, this, that and the other. Um, it was just generally bad feeling, but people were forced back to work. They had no choice, they had no money, you know, and, and you've got to, you know, some of these people had three, four kids and mortgages and, you know, so you, you had to look at it from both sides, I think, really. There, was, there were times when, you know, even I picked a brick up, whether I threw it or not, I can't remember, but, you know, people were then picking bricks up or throwing it at coaches. Windows. You know, you got you got caught up in it. Parkside wasn't a, a pretty militant pit. It did have its elements of militancy, but that was that was sort of secluded down to maybe a dozen or so people. You'll always get a hard liner uh, in any industry, in any in any walk of life. And uh, but as a whole, the colliery wasn't very militant at all. I, th I, th I think during the miners strike um, women were at home, quite a lot of women, and there was no money coming in and they just felt that they had to get something sorted to make sure that you know people knew what was going on. I mean when you think about them going out with, with the buckets and, and, and the collecting, I mean that was tantamount to, to begging really. I mean and it took an awful lot of guts to go out and do it because they'd no money, they were just absolutely desperate. And I think that's as a reason, as a result of that, the women decided, well, right, we'll do our bit towards it. We'll, we'll start manning the soup kitchens. We'll see if we can get food from, you know, the supermarkets or anybody who's prepared to provide it. And they got together as an army and, and tried to make sure that people had food on the table and that the children didn't suffer too much. <laughs> 